Welcome. I'm Ashley Studholm with the Prince William Conservation Alliance. Stay up to date with our upcoming events by going to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash pwconserve or on our, web, on our website at pwconserve.org. Click on calendar in there, you will find the list of our upcoming events. We organize events on a wide range of topics free of charge with the support of people like you. Become a member or donate by clicking join us on our webpage. Thank you for making our work to support healthy and sustainable communities in Prince William County possible. So as I said, we have Julie Flanagan here who um, is responsible for planting a lot of trees in Prince William County. And she's going to tell us about this particular case, why it matters, and how it came to be and where it can go in the future. So without further ado, Julie, I'm going to turn the program over to you. So you should Thank first, you. yes, unmute. Yeah. yeah, I'm unmuted. Thank you, Kim. Um, it's a pleasure to be with all of you. I see a lot of faces here, and many of them very familiar. So uh, welcome. I hope you enjoy the story tonight. And I hope that um, when we get to the end, maybe it'll get you thinking about some places you know about that might uh, be available to put some trees and create some new forest as well. So I'm going to share my screen. And then I'll need to make sure that I'm doing this right. I've done uh, something I probably shouldn't do, which is try to have um, some sound embedded into the program. So hopefully you'll hear the sounds. Come on. There we go. All right. So now this is a story of a forest that was, was lost and has been found. It's, it's a story of a forest in a time of war and peace and how one man's forest got lost in the Civil War and was reclaimed 150 years later. So our story of the forest begins in a time of peace. In the late 1850s, when Bristow Station was a new crossroads in Prince William County. Bristow Station back then was a quiet place, a land of long expanses of farm fields where sunsets lingered on the horizon, broken only by forests where local, locals hunted game and drew from the forest resources. And although Bristow Station was a small and quiet place, it had three key ingredients that any modern day realtor would envy. Location, location, location. So what made it a good location? Well, Broad Run flowed nearby, a major stream with a permanent uh, flow of water that was reliable and available to many people. Also had a good country road that allowed horse-drawn and foot traffic and led directly to the county seat in Brentsville, which was only three miles south down the road. You can see it, that little cluster of houses down in the southern part of the picture there. It was the, the county's seat at that time. And perhaps most importantly, the Orange and Alexandria Railroad passed through carrying passengers and goods on its way to major population center of Alexandria before returning south through the towns of Northern Virginia, terminating in rural, in the rural community of Orange County. And this is where we find Thomas K. Davis, a farmer, a family man, a man of law, and a businessman. We have no image of what Mr. Davis looked like but we know a fair amount about him. For four years, Mr. Davis was, the, was elected as the sheriff of Prince William County. He served two terms, elected twice, or elected twice. He would have been entirely familiar with the Brentsville courthouse and jail, but as a new de decade approached and perhaps with foresight about the changing political culture, Thomas Davis turned his interests to the land. In 1858, he bought, purchased 138 acres of good quality farmland and woods in Bristow Station, 
right along the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. By 1861, he had built his two-story home with a porch, a garret, and two chimneys. It had a stone basement and a shed off to the side. The home was built of clapboard and he painted it white. He built himself a barn and a stable for his two horses and a corn house to hold feed for his eight or 10 head of cattle. Of importance to any farmer is a woodlot. Mr. Davis owned two. One was a short walk from his home and covered 30 plus acres of land. It was composed mostly of pine. The other lay about a mile away, 40 plus acres of oak and pine, but mostly good quality oak, able to provide firewood and building materials and hunting grounds. A good woodlot was a valuable asset to any farmer. And finally, Thomas Davis expanded his business interests and built a mercantile store in Bristow Station. But even as he built his homestead, the times were changing rapidly. Deep divides in the minds and spirits of the people had become intractable. Contrary to many of his neighbors, Davis was a union man. He owned no slaves and he opposed slavery. As election day approached in 1860, Davis declined to run again for sheriff. He and the other union sympathizers had even more serious things to consider. Secession was on the ballot. In 1860, things were getting very hot and I declined to be a candidate. When the day approached for the vote on the ordinance of secession, the rebel army had begun to collect in this section and the union men talked the thing over and concluded that the best thing they could do was to stay away from the polls, feeling satisfied that if we voted against secession, we would be mobbed. In the same year that Davis settled into his new home, the first battle of the Civil War was fought not six miles away. The first battle of Bull Run, July 21st, 1861. Spectators came from Washington, D.C., and soldiers paraded in formation. But the theater of the first battle of Bull Run quickly changed. Davis may well have heard cannon fire on that hot July day as people scattered for safety. Afterwards, troops scattered too, and unfortunately for Mr. Davis, war strategy placed a high value on railroads. They were the pipelines for troops, for troop movements and for the principal means of supplies for both sides of the war. With the Orange and Alexandria, railroad passing so long so close to Mr. Davis's property and his land that he and his neighbors could not avoid attracting attention from both sides of the conflict. After the first battle of Bull Run, Confederate units established encampments in Bristow Station to guard the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. The encampments became known as Camp Jones after an Alabama infantry colonel who died there. He died of his wounds suffered in the Manassas Battle. And the soldiers stayed until the march, until March of 1862. Now the Confederates knew that Davis sided with the Union and they tried repeatedly to, and unsuccessfully to force him into service. In March of 1862, those troops encamped at Bristow Station retreated southward as Union forces pressured them from the north. Before the rebels left, they destroyed Davis's store. That was the first of several encampments and battles that devastated this land. As the Confederate troops moved south, federal forces under the command of General Rufus King followed close behind. When King's forces reached Bristow Station. The country was alive with troops all around. There came on a terrific storm of snow and rain and sleet, which lasted several days. The rivers were high and the mud very deep and the soldiers and their horses got very wet and cold. The officers and soldiers used all of Mr. Davis's rails and fence boards and other loose wood around the place for fuel. And then they began on the standing wood and timber. When the army came in, his farm was well fenced. And when they went away, his land was open to the commons. 
and it was almost impossible to find a rail or a stick of dry wood. When King's troops departed from the area, they took with them Davis's cattle and his two horses. Over the next months, the land around Bristow Station rode the seesaw of Union and Confederate forces alternately taking control. When the Battle of Kettle Run was fought there in 1862, August of 1862, the Union ultimately won, but not before the ONA was destroyed and over 500 soldiers had died. Upon their victory, the Union forces set up a hospital and their headquarters in Davis's house. But by 1863, the war had taken too much from Davis. From the breaking out of the war until 1863, I was farming and merchandising at Bristow Station, where the rebels burned me out twice on account of my political sentiments. I was a Union man, straight out from the beginning to the present day. I farmed until 1862, when the rebels stopped me. And in September of 1863, Davis and his family fled the area for Washington, D.C. On October 14th of 1863, barely a month after Davis and his family fled the area, the Battle of Bristow Station settled the last major advancement of the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia. Union troops won a decisive victory, and Lee's forces never again held this ground. But that was not the end to the damages of war to Thomas's land. Following the Union victory of the Battle of Bristow Station, General Samuel Crawford was assigned to guard the railroad. And over the winter of 1863 to 1864, Crawford set up his headquarters and his Pennsylvania Reserve Division established their winter camps. Crawford and his Pennsylvania Reserve Division commandeered what was left of Davis's property, destroying the outbuildings and those of several properties nearby. Davis's friend and neighbor, Mr. Warmly A. Rollins, gave testimony to the destruction he witnessed. Over half of the farm was in timber and cut down and used by the King's troops and the Shields troops and other Union troops, General Crawford's and others. I saw with my own eyes the troops from Crawford's division hauling the, with U.S. teams and carrying on their backs the lumber from Mr. Davis's buildings. I saw them tearing them down. I saw them building huts of the material. They used the brick and stone for fireplaces and chimneys and the lumber and timber to make the buildings. Some of them had logs for the foundations or main parts and the timber for the roofing. Some of the timber from Mr. Davis's woods were built into huts. And here, with his land decimated, his home and business destroyed, his forest cleared down to stumps for firewood and huts, we leave the story of Mr. Thomas K. Davis. But the story of his forest and his land continues. With the surrender of Robert E. Lee at Appomattox, the Civil War ends and the country slowly recovers. The land enters into an era of peace, and with peace and time came prosperity. So our story now carries us forward through time, through a time of peace, 140 years to the year 2002. As the country as a whole has grown, so has the federal government in Washington, D.C., and suburban sprawl has made its way to Prince William County. And the area around the historic grounds of the Bristow Station battlefield has become a hotbed of housing development. Centex Ohms wants to build, wants to develop 341 acres for a community they will call New Bristow Village. The land is owned by a family named Rollins and their property now includes 136 acres that Mr. Davis once owned. But Centex isn't the only one with an eye on the property. A nonprofit organization that seeks to preserve Civil War history called the Civil War Trust contacts Centex. And Centex works with the Trust and with Prince William County 
to separate out 133 acres of the property to preserve a piece of the Bristow Station battlefield, including Mr. Davis's land. In 2007, with the 133 acres now owned by the county's Board of Supervisors, Bristow Station Battlefield Heritage Park opens to the public. Well, by the late 1970s, excuse me, meanwhile, another, another series of events on a much grander environmental scale play into the future of Mr. Davis's forest. By the late 1970s, decades of sediment-laden runoff from farming and development have severely damaged the Chesapeake Bay. In the mid-1980s, the federal government, with the cooperation of D.C., Maryland, Virginia, and West Virginia, began regulatory measures to clean the bay. However, after 20-plus years of efforts, scientists and regulation, regulators had to admit that the past efforts, which were mostly focused on changing stormwater regulations, had yielded inadequate results. In 2009, recognizing what urban foresters knew all along, that trees and especially forests have no equal in their ability to purify stormwater while providing numerous other ecological benefits, regulators finally considered giving trees more of their due. They created a crediting program that encourages reforestation as a means of cleaning streams and saving the bay. Prince William County joined the effort. And from then on, the county's lowly arborist snatched little bits of time away from her normal duties to search online for places that might be reforested. Battlefields, however, were not high on her list of places to search. In her mind, battles were fought in open fields. Managers of parks who focused on interpreting historic battles sought to return their parks to the conditions of the 1860s so visitors might gain a more realistic understanding of the battle conditions. It's a noble goal, but one that seemed to her to lead to remo the removal of forests and not their recreation. She was unfamiliar with the history of Bristow Station, but she was familiar with the 140 acres of forest cleared from the Manassas National Battlefield Park as managers there sought to replicate battle conditions. In the 1860s, a Mr. Bronner owned a farm there full of open fields, but his land had since naturally regrown into forest. And so around 2007, the national park managers cleared out the forest, returning the land to the field-like conditions that existed during the two Civil War battles fought there. So when our lowly arborist looked at the open fields of Bristow Station, she held little hope for a planting project. Well, still, maybe the park managers would be willing to let her reforest an acre or two along the edges of an intermittent stream that ran along the western edge of the property. Perhaps if she asked nicely. So she wrote an email in January of 2016, which led to the county's historic preservation Div division and to Bill Backus, the park manager lowly arborist. Bill, would you be willing to let watershed management reforest a few acres of land around this intermittent stream? Bill, well, I don't know about that. But we've been doing research into Mr. Davis's land and we've identified some areas elsewhere, about 13 acres that were part of his woodlot during the 1860s. Would you be interested in reforesting that? Well, the arborist's heart soars. Bill and the staff of Historic Preservation had identified three fields that were once part of Davis's 31-acre pine tract and could be replanted. The largest field was 8.5 acres in size. And then there was a smaller 1.8-acre field. And then a 2.7-acre riparian corridor that followed a perennial stream. And for good measure, they agreed to plant the intermittent stream from her original request. A total of 14 acres. She couldn't be happier. An uncharacteristically warm winter allowed planting to begin in February of 2017. The fields were mowed and planting began in late February. 
Small saplings made their ways into the fertile soils. Sycamores and red maples, willow and swamp white oaks, small trees like hornbeam and redbud. 17 different species in all, a rich diversity which was needed to meet the varied field conditions. And barely two months after planting those 14 acres was completed, Bill Backus called the arborist. He'd been reading those historic documents again. This time, he found letters of soldiers writing of how they marched through the forest along the Orange and Alexandria Railroad before reaching the open fields. Bill, would you like to plant another 4.5 acres? He asked the arborist. Oh man, this park was turning into one of those corny TV commercials with the sales hook. But wait, there's more. And so in the fall of 2017, an additional 4.5 acres was planted with 2,925 trees. It was completed in the fall of 2017. Oh, those historians, they seem to have nothing better to do than read. In 2018, Bill called again. But wait, there's more. As their research continued, it became clear that the land behind the brick house, now used as the park office, was wooded at the time of the battles. We have another area for you if you're interested. Oh man, of course the arborist was interested. And so another 10.2 acres and 5,570 young trees go into the ground in the fall of 2020. That was a grand total now of all those locations together of 28.7 acres and 18,425 trees. So would Mr. Davis recognize his land if he were to miraculously walk onto his old homestead today? Well, certainly he would recognize the railroad still running, though the steam engines are gone and it's now owned by Norfolk and Southern. He might recognize the contours of his land and the feel of the loamy soil, but it will be a long time before the canopies of those new trees rise high over a man's head the way his pines did. No, the forest that has been found will be distinct from that which was lost. It'll rise from rich meadows of forbs and grasses. It'll rise from oaks and sycamores, river birches and sweet gums and cherries that were planted, and from the ash and persimmon trees and the sumac shrubs that have voluntarily seeded in. It'll hold greater diversity of species than his pine woodlot. And this forest that was found will continue to be found not only by us humans, but found by the myriad of other creatures who need to find it today and need to find it tomorrow. In the close years that follow before us, the forest found will live in the stages of early succession, where grasses and shrubs and forbs like common milkweed will dominate. Caterpillars will feed on their host plants, like the Gulf fritillary on purple passion vine. Common yellowthroats will hide in the dense thickets in summer, searching out those caterpillars to feed their young. In winter, mixed flocks of sparrows will scratch away debris looking for seeds. And the downy woodpecker will peck away at galls on goldenrod, hoping to find the juicy larvae of the goldenrod gall fly inside. And as the trees begin to rise above the goldenrods and the winged sumacs, birds that need this next stage of forest will find Mr. Davis's new forest. This is that time in a new forest growth where although the trees are now above the shrubs and forbs around them and their shadows are growing ever taller, the trees are still young and their canopies have not yet joined together. The dominance of the herbaceous plants is fading away, but they're not gone yet. This is when the prairie warblers will find the forest and sing their rising trills. 
For perhaps 20 years, the summer songs of breeding prairie warblers will be heard while the forest found remains a mix of forbs and young trees. Then in time, the trees will gain full dominance and close out the sun from the plants below. By then, the prairie warbler will have left in search of new young forest where it can build their homes and raise their young. And then someday, when our children are bringing their children to walk the paths of Civil War history, someday off in the future, our children might spy a screech owl brooding over her young in the cavity of an old oak, while her partner looks on, waiting for night to fall, so she can hunt, so he can hunt mice in the duff of the forest floor. And then the drumming of the pileated woodpeckers will resonate through that quiet that only an old forest can bring. Perhaps even scarlet tanagers might find a forest with enough woods to make their home here. And this is where we leave the forest found with a hope for a long and fruitful future. Thank you very much, Julie. That was pretty interesting. I didn't know hardly any of that. And thanks for your good work in planting trees in Prince William County. Does anybody to start off have a comment or a question? Oh, wait. And before that, I want to introduce Rob and give him a minute to say hi. Oh, there you are, Rob. Hello. How's everyone doing? Yes. And you are the... Um, I'm the division manager for historic preservation and parks and rec. And, and Julia was great to work on this project to help us, you know, return that landscape back to the way it was. And of course, you know, do so many great things for the natural environment out there as well. So great project. I'm glad she was able to highlight it tonight. Okay, so we have Julie and Rob both who are available to, for comments and questions. And I know Julie's looking for ideas on next places to plant trees, if you have any. Yeah. Yeah, seriously. So yeah, this was um, you know, quite the boon for us in one site to have historic preservation coming back to us time and again and and bringing us more area that we could um, reforest. Uh, um, so one thing, just if you, we continue to look for places in Prince William County, both on public land and on uh, community land, like HOA projects and common areas and things like that. Um, so if you think of any place you can think of that you know might be a good spot for that, um, by all means, uh, give me a holler. And um, we have some criteria that we look for that prioritize which areas we do. So we'll take your site and, and fit it into those criteria and see how it goes. And who knows, you may be the instigator of uh, another new forest. No ideas, no questions. Nancy, oh, you're on mute. No, I, I just no. unmuted. <laughs> um, I do love forests. I mean, I, I really, really love forests, but we don't have that many grasslands around um, for a lot of grassland species of birds that are, you know, um, imperiled or whatever. Um, Rob, can you tell us how many um, acres of grasslands are managed and what um, species of grasses you're using? Oh gosh, I'm here for the history. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I can't say as as um and as far as Bristow Station goes, uh, everything else that's not been planted and already in woods is grasslands, and we've been slowly working to and and Kim knows this as well. Slowly working to try to get those fields back to some good states. When we got the land, it, it sat fallow for such a long time, and the developer owned it and built the neighborhood next to it. It did nothing with it, so the soil wasn't that great. So we've been slowly working. We, probably, we could do a better job, of course. Um, but I'd say right now at Bristow, it's about 80 acres of grasslands that we have. Um, we're about to, I'm not sure if you all know this, but the same organization that Julia mentioned earlier that saved this land and gave it to the county just bought 130 acres at Bristow as well across the train tracks. That was supposed to be a business park. Um, and they bought that outright, and they're going to donate to the county and we're in that process right now to donate that 130 acres to the county to add to the battlefield park. Um, and, there's, and there's some grasslands there and there's some woodlands there. But we haven't 
we haven't uh, gotten on it too much, but it's got it's a long broad run, so we have you know broad run frontage as well. So uh, hopefully we'll, more about that coming in the near future. But as far as the grasslands go at Bristow, it's about 80 acres. Thank you. Okay, and I see a question here from Linda Ligon. Do you want to ask yourself, Linda? She was, you there? Linda wants to know how on earth <laughs> do you keep deer from de destroying everything, all these trees, the little trees you planted? Well, um, I think uh, we're, we're not, it's a good question and I'm not sure that how much they are destroying. <laughs> Um, the, because of the historic na nature of the park, we didn't uh, use any tubes. You, oftentimes when we plant uh, reforestation, we'll use protective tubes, which are specifically to help protect the trees from deer browse. Um, in this case, because we didn't, um, well, really two reasons. One, historically, we just didn't want a bunch of tubes in the, in the park, but also it would have been, as you, it would have been 18,000 tubes to put in and 18,000 tubes to take off. Um, so we didn't, we didn't use those. And what we did instead was we increased the density. So normally when we replant um, a forest, we use a density of about 450 tree seedlings per acre. In this case, uh, we used 650 tree seedlings per acre. And that's usually what we bump up the density uh, in order to compensate for unprotected trees that are more subject to being browsed by deer. Um, so, I think generally that's, um, we're, we're not trying to protect them from deer. We're just trying to sort of, in a sense, overwhelm the deer with um, options. <laughs> and I will say that one of the things, I, I wish I had a little more background from, um, I don't know if Rob would be able to, to give any of this, but when we went and planted, um, a couple of the fields we planted were, already coming up in meadow about a year or two before we planted. So when we mowed to plant, there was already a really healthy, healthy complement of things like sumac and blackberry and um, goldenrod and a, a variety of forbs that were already coming up in a really beautiful meadows. And so that, I think, uh, if you go out there today, I don't know how many of you have actually been out there to walk around. It's a great place to walk. It's about, I think it's almost three miles of, of trail. Isn't it like two and a half miles of trail or something like that? Um, so it's a great place to take a walk. Uh, but if when you walk around, so you'll see some of the places that we reforested are six foot tall. There's the forbs that are there, the shrubs that are there that pre predated our planting are now in, in the five and six foot tall range it's thick as thieves in there. And I think some of that actually makes it difficult for the deer to get through. And a ton of it is um, blackberry, which I think also makes it deer difficult for the deer to get through. So uh, to some degree, I think simply the, the density of which the forbs and the shrubs have come in have made it a little bit more difficult and uh, for them to find the trees, but also have given them a lot of other things that they can browse on besides the trees. So um, hopefully that answers your question. Mike, you had a great question. You can ask or I can read it. It's up to you. You can read it. Go for it. Okay. Um, Julia, I love the presentation, number one. But number two, you know, driving around the rural crescent, I'm seeing so many 10 acre lots being developed of houses in farm fields. And it appears that most of these people, you know, there's an exception here or there, but most of them just either try to mow all 10 acres or just leave it all just fallow. And it seems like an, a golden opportunity to increase our forest cover if the county could actually go to these owners and, and plant trees. I think most, I would think that they would like to live in a forest versus in a overgrown field. Um, have you thought about doing that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, now that you ask. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. Well, I'm wondering if, if, if you were prompted to ask that because that, no. that's actually. <laughs> no, I wasn't. But I mean, if you go down like Carriage Ford Road, yeah. Eden Road, Hazelwood, you know, Valley View, I mean, it's personally, it's horrendous the, what it looks like. It's not a rural character at all anymore. Yeah. Uh, the way they're lining those houses up on the, on the, on the streets. Yeah. But on the other hand, it leaves a whole bunch of room that I know like people like Jay Yankee can't, haven't been able to farm because they're too narrow. They're, 
200 feet to 2,000 feet and there's fences and, but it'd be great to just plant trees. I, I agree. Um, it's, a, it's a huge opportunity and um, one that, that we are looking into currently, how we might be able to do something in the rural area. Um, we're currently working with Soil and Water Conservation District because as, as things are sort of divvied up in terms of um, programming, <clears throat> excuse me, programming, Soil and Water, <clears throat> excuse me, Soil and Water has the primary lead in working on land that is zoned for agriculture. And so all those 10 acre lots are still sitting on A1 zoning. And um, so what we're doing right now is we're coming alongside them and we're learning about their, the programs that they have, which are, um, one's called Ag Share and another one is the VCAP. Um, and both of those are, well, Ag Share in particular is dependent upon there having been some agricultural use of the property within the last two, within two out of the last five years. So if it's a relatively new um, residential subdivision that either currently somebody's haying or they've been haying it two out of the last five years, they qualify for ag share. And ag share does have a cost share program that does reforest or can reforest the land there. And we just actually just had a meeting about a month ago, a um, little over a month ago, uh, with Supervisor Lawson's office and um, the Soil and Water Conservation District looking at a particular uh, subdivision and trying to see if we could um, garner interest among the residents there to, uh, to use the, the Ag Share program. And preferably, as I'm sure you're aware, the, the benefit of reforesting multiplies the more you can take uh, of, of an area that's farm field if it's next to an area that's forest, or if it's next to a riparian quarter that's wooded, and you can plant that area, and if you can take that that ten acre lot owner and the next and his next door neighbor and his next door neighbor and his next door neighbor, and get them cooperatively and collectively to agree to reforesting, then you're just multipl multiplying the benefits not only to stormwater but ecologically of reforesting those lands. So the question is, how do we do that? And um, that's what we're looking at. And I think we're not the only ones looking at it. My understanding is the state has a program that's a like a pilot program, not here in Prince William County, but there's there are two counties within the state. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I'm probably not going to get the name of it right, but it's basically looking at how they might use um, carbon credits that we don't need because we're not in the um, treaties that are in Europe. So Europe and all these con other countries have um, climate accord treaties that require them, require businesses to compensate for the carbon that they're using and, or creating. And so they're looking at any place within the globe that they can go and do something like reforest and get the carbon credits for those and then sell them to these people who need to use them because they're creating carbon. Um, so that's going on, soil and water is going on, and then we're sitting there looking at how we might fit into that. And we don't have an answer for that yet, but I think you're absolutely right. The opportunity is vast out there. And there's also an opportunity we don't wanna let it slip by. So if you're at Bristow Village, I, I commute down Bristow Road as part of my daily commute. So if you were to come out of um, Bristow Station Battlefield and get on Bristow Road and go toward um, uh, Dumfries, within a mile, you would pass some of those homes that you're talking about, which are a um, 10 acre lots that have been built on the right side of Bristow Road. Um, there's the sod fields on the left and the single family um, 10 acre lots on the right. And some of those owners are to the point where they've decided they don't wanna mow anymore and they've just let it go. I think you know, 30, 40 years ago, that would have been absolutely fine because the number of invasive plants we had then are not quite as bad as they are now. But now what you see, and there's, there's two people in particular, I, I passed by their homes, and you go by there in, in uh, early April and it's white. And the reason it's white is because there's a bazillion calorie pears in those fields. Now, for those who don't know, calorie pear is a non-native tree 
that um, was very, very popular in the landscaping industry. It was used for many decades and um, still is used, but it is uh, a, pear, a tree that is able to easily escape cultivated sites and it loves to be in disturbed land. It loves to be in open fields. It's an early successional type of tree. So it comes into old fields and instead of them filling up with what normally you'd have them fill up with things like Virginia pine, uh, black cherry, sassafras, persimmon, red cedar, instead of them filling up with that, they're filling up with Bradford pears and they're filling up with um, autumn olive, which is another non-native, it's a shrub that's non-native. And so those two fields, particularly, you go by them and there's, there's basically three plants. There's a bazillion Bradford pears, there's a bazillion autumn olive, and thankfully there's red cedar, the only native in that trio. So I, I think we also wanna look at that, not only from the standpoint of it's an opportunity for looking at sort of mode areas, but it's also an opportunity to try and direct and, and um, get healthy native forests going rather than these immense acreages of non-native plants. So that was kind of a long answer, but- um, so, Julie, I totally agree with you, but I'm, I'm also thinking, and those are good programs, but they're very slow to get going. Yeah. Um, so I just keep thinking, I and mean, the carbon credits, and that, again, is a good idea, but right now the price of carbon credits is so low, it's like $10 a ton. You get about a hundred tons max per acre. So a thousand dollars, it's not covering the costs. Mm -hmm. That's why you go to Africa for a lot of this stuff, it's, mm -hmm. it's so cheap. Yeah. But, but the county has a TMDL requirement in the Chesapeake Bay program, and you could actually get nutrient credits for your TMDL permits mm -hmm. at a much lower cost if you, because the landowners ideally would give this, if, if you came in and said, I'll plant a forest on your land for free, you're getting the land for free. So all of a sudden you could get nutrient credits cheaper than you can buy them on the market. And it could be a way for the county to save money long-term improve its forest cover, improve ecology, improve water quality? You know, we're, we're been, we've been discussing that internally and I am not um, really proficient on how the TMDL credits go, but I think one of the problems we have to look at with that is that the rural area is not in the MS4 permit. Um, so, you, yes. Trade, Say again? You can trade. You can trade? I, I'll, we can talk offline, but I, I yeah. just seeing this opportunity and it's, mm -hmm. I mean, I hate the fact these houses are being built like a subdivision on the side of the road, that's my pet peeve. It's, to me, that defeats the purpose of the rural character, but that's life. At least let's get some trees out there. Yeah, yeah, the ones that we've, I've looked at, um, just to kind of, we've, I've probably reforested in the last 20 years about 70, 75 acres. In the rural area, if we can figure out how to do that, we could possibly do 70, 75 acres in two or three years, or maybe even less. So um, I think it's a bonanza that's sitting there if we can just figure out how to, to make it work with the crediting and the, the benefits that we would the county would be able to claim as a result of putting the money into it. So absolutely, let's talk offline and I, I appreciate whatever input you'd have. Thank you, great presentation. Okay, Russ. Do you want to ask your, Russ wants to know more about beavers and trees and how that affects your selection. <laughs> well, and thankfully- Russ, you should jump in if I didn't get that right. Are beavers a consideration in tree selections when I'm reading in the chat? Um, so far, no, but I haven't had a site where I've been decimated by beavers yet. <laughs> Although one of my next plantings may very well be one of those sites because it's in a very low area that um, in the past has had a lot of beaver activity in it. So um, we, what we would do with beavers is basically the same thing that we would do with deer. We'll, we'll put the protective tubes up and that will save the trees for a period of time. But eventually the trees have to come off and, excuse me, the tubes have to come off and um, then they're open to the beavers. So what often happens in these sites uh, and which is very desirable is that you get a lot of volunteer trees that come in and so what i would hope with some of the sites where you're more prone to beavers is that we might be able to protect them long enough to um, keep the beavers at bay and have an opportunity for a combination of the trees we planted and volunteer trees to come in 
and maybe keep the beavers happy enough that they wouldn't destroy everything. But I actually, I actually haven't had a site. Um, well, I'll, I'll take that back. I did have a couple trees come down at Veterans Park where we planted one acre and a beaver took them down. But we planted a thousand trees out there and we only had like two come down from beavers. So I really don't have a, haven't had an experience yet where the beavers have been such a problem that I've um, had to do something more drastic about that. Oh, thanks. Uh, I was also thinking, do they prefer like cottonwoods or certain ones of the trees that you pick or seems like sycamores if you're going on those riparian areas are preferred or not? Yeah, I, I don't really know what species I, since I haven't had to worry about it, I haven't really looked into that, but I'm sure there are ones that taste better than others and uh, or have better, you know, cambium <laughs> for the yeah. beavers than others. So I'm sure once I get to the point of having to be thoughtful about beaver, beavers, I'll start looking into um, the species selection for that. Appreciate it. Thanks, Amelia. It was a tremendous presentation. Thank you. Okay, Lucia, do you want to make your comment? It sounds like you totally agree with Mike about the visual appearance of houses in the uh, rural area. Yeah, we, we go, I live in Woodbridge and we go down to um, Warrington for my daughter's retinologist and we go along, it's called um, Dumfries Road once you get into Fauquier County and you drive along and there there's this acres and acres of pasture land with these great big houses set down in the middle of a pasture and it just <laughs> looks, I, I, I would even volunteer to come and, and dig a hole to plant a tree if you ever get this thing off the ground. <laughs> That's great. When we did meet with the, the folks that live in the subdivision that we, we had the community meeting with, um, we had a relatively minor, uh, actually a, a minor number of the people that live there um, came. I don't know how much of that was due to COVID or, or just a, a lack of interest, but the folks that did come all of them said the reason they moved into the rural area because they wanted to be near trees and they wanted to be near nature. So I would think, and these may have been people who bought a lot that had relatively few trees on it. So they may be thinking automatically, I've got land that I can put trees onto. Um, but I, I think certainly if we can help by um, supplying some financial assistance to that, it'll be something that'll be more motivating and easier for people to do. I would be interested in hearing the answer to Nancy's question about uh, who planted all those trees, contractors or volunteers? Oh, um, a little bit of uh, both. A lot of contractors, a little bit of volunteers. Um, we've done several volunteer plantings and I, and I love doing them because I find that the volunteers do every bit as good a job as the contractors do. Um, but volunteers uh, aren't able to do the production that we needed to put in 20 some acres of of trees. So we had uh, one volunteer planting um, that was done with uh, folks from the Youth Ambassadors for the Environment, which my coworker who's now retired, Deb Oliver, she headed that up. And that was a, an effort where we brought families together and the parents would come out with their kids and do um, volunteer uh, efforts of like stream cleanups and all sorts of things. And they, um, they came out and helped with that as well as we had, oftentimes we'll have scout troops that come out uh, and help with that. So we had maybe about 25 people that came out and put about a quarter acre of trees in one of that field that was 1.8 acres. If you remember one of the smaller fields, um, a corner of that was planted by the volunteers. And I'll say it's doing great. The trees are just coming up fantastic there. It looks like somebody, uh, Jenny, commented that she goes to um, Bristol Battlefield with her dog. It's becoming a really popular park. It's a great place to take your dog or, or run or walk or whatever. And um, the I know Parks has been looking at um, keeping track of the different birds that are coming into that area. They noticed that when, of course, no surprise, but they had a, like a sort of an informal bird survey before they began to let the meadows come in. And then they did another bird survey um, after they had let the meadows come in for like a year or so. And I think uh, they doubled the number of bird species that were found. And then um, I think, uh, Rob, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're continuing to do that. And, um, and we're very hopeful to see how that's gonna change as, as the, the forest continues to grow. 
Oh, you want to tell us a little more, Rob? Hitting me with these nature questions. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, Julia's right. We uh, we did we're doing annual surveys. The state came in, did the last one. We haven't gotten uh, the report back, but the one we did the year previously, um, I forget the number, but it, it was double what we had five years before. So we've definitely seen a big growth um, in the bird population. And I, I learned about that mostly from visitors because people send us pictures. We have lots of bird watchers that come out to the park and they are quick to tell us, we haven't seen this here in this area for so many years. And so it's really cool to hear that. And we've definitely seen an increase in the number of visitors that come to the park to see you know, wildlife, not just birds, but other things as well. So it's definitely had a big impact on you know, the, the people that are coming to the park. It's not just runners and dog walkers, which we get a lot of, and we love those too, but we get history people, of course, but we're seeing a huge influx of tourists from outside the area who are coming to the outfield just to see it for its nature, which is a great tourism draw for the county as well. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of variety of um, habitats, some of them small, but nonetheless varied. There's, there's small areas of uh, herbaceous wetlands. There's areas that we planted with trees, which actually, I know uh, Kim and I talked not too long ago about um, kind of Nancy's concern that, that this was going to come into forest and we, we could use that, that meadow um, habitat as well. And uh, I think it's... We, we planted a lot of little bitty seedlings that were only um, about 12, 18 inches tall. And the meadow came in so thick that the, a lot of those were sort of buried underneath the, um, the forbs. Uh, and so I'm, I'm not sure if they're yet to poke their heads above or if maybe they got outcompeted by the meadows. And so I think ultimately in, in like the next 20 years, you're not going to see all of those areas, if you look at them all cumulatively, you're not going to see a really dense forest come in for quite some time. I think there's some areas that are that smaller 1.8 acre um, field is going to come in probably first and close out its canopy first. It has a lot of um, between the stuff that we planted, which, which had a really good survival rate on it, and the, all the trees that are seeding into that area, I think that area is going to go to a closed canopy this in the most recent amount of time. But some of the other areas, that eight and a half acre area, has um, a real patchwork of where the trees that we've put in have survived and where um, trees have voluntarily come in and where that's happening on a much slower uh, rate, uh, pace. So I think as, as this goes on for, for quite a few years, I would say at least a couple decades, you're going to see a couple decades, you're going to see a, a real patchwork of forest and meadow um, developing in there. So I, I don't think it's going to go to real forest quite as, as thickly as might be uh, initially thought. Also, I was thinking about, um, I remember Nancy and we were on some, we were on a bus tour with, uh, I think it was the Virginia Department of Forestry, but we were over at um, uh, the battlefield, Manassas battlefield, and, and we saw that Henslow Sparrow. And it got me to, to thinking about um, that Bristol Battlefield might be a potential spot for Henslow Sparrow as well. And that is going to be something that will only be in those grassy areas, tall grassy areas. It won't, if it converts to forest, it won't be there. But that there might be opportunity as the battlefield continues to maintain a good portion of the site as meadow or as grass, um, that they might be able to get some Henslow Sparrows in there. And if Manassas Battlefield is also doing the same thing, maybe there's a little, uh, there's going to be a gap between those two, but they're not that far away. Maybe they might share populations or something like that. I, I could be dreaming, but that's uh, something that would be nice. Dreaming is good. Mm -hmm. Valerie, do you want to share what's going on in the Bluebird Trail lately? Well, nothing much lately, but, but well, last year? <laughs> not much lately, but um, yes, last uh, year, Virginia Bluebird Society installed a trail at the Bristol Battlefield, and it's being regularly monitored, and we are absolutely thrilled with the opportunity to work with these kinds of areas, because this is the absolute perfect habitat for bluebird nest box trails, so... Thank you to the battlefield for letting us in.
and I'll say I'll say really quick about the Bluebird um, boxes. When we do tours out there, guided tours, that is the one of the top things people ask us. What is that? And are there Bluebirds in there? Once we tell them it's a Bluebird box, so um, people are getting people are noticing uh, those Bluebird boxes out there, and we get a lot of questions about them. So there's an education process there too for the general public about why those things are important. So. I think that helps the overall mission of what we're doing out there too. So thank you all for doing that. You're welcome, Rob. There's, there's some other parks in the county we'd really like to restore, which is sort of off topic, but we would really like to restore the trail at Silver Lake and um, haven't had a whole lot of success. And there's a trail at Hellwig Park that needs work as well, but we're getting there. So thank you very much. And Mike, in the chat, you point out an important um, thing about beavers. Maybe you want to fill in a little bit. He's, there you are. Um, sure. I mean, you know, beavers do eat trees as part of their life cycle, but they they create wonderful habitats in terms of diversity of species that, that live there as well as use it, and they improve water quality significantly. So, you know, I think it's kind of good to plant trees, and actually at Huntley Meadows, we purposely planted willows um, on islands to, to provide food for the trees, uh, for the beavers. And uh, what we did there is we actually did an alternating program where some are fenced off and some are not. And on a, every five years, the idea is to unfence certain areas to allow them to have more mature willows to eat. Um, but if you, you know, what, what the beavers tend to do is they migrate up and down in terms of when they eat out an area and it's too much work to go get more trees for their dam maintenance and food, then they'll go upstream or downstream to another area. That area will, will um, eventually the dam will breach for no maintenance and then it begins to reforest and over time when it's reforested enough, beavers come back. Um, and a lot of the, you know, when I first moved here, there were a lot of stream valleys still that had, you know, 10 to 50 beaver dams and, and staircases at different ages of and, and maintenance. Um, now it's not there's actually more beavers overall, but they're not as prolific, I guess, I mean, because people tend to to not like them in their neighborhoods when they're building houses. Um, but I just think that the, I think they're a wonderful improvement to the habitat. I guess I'll stop talking. <laughs> well I certainly agree with that. Beavers are fantastic and, and Huntley Meadows has been an education for me to see exactly what you've been talking about, Mike, how I, I grew up in that area and to, um, to see it changed over like the last 30 years and that how dynamic it is because of the beaver activity is, is really, you, you sort of have to realize that you're just adjusting to the dynamic way that nature is. It doesn't stay static and, and that's a good thing. Great. And then if any, we have a question about where you can get wood duck boxes. Partial, no easy partial yeah. suppliers. You can you can buy them there. Online would be the oh, answer. Right, right. No, I thought you had the, the bluebird trail thing. I was curious if they have any effort to to repopulate and get get those beautiful wood ducks around too. They are beautiful. They are beautiful, but we, um, we've got our hands full in the Commonwealth with Bluebird Nest Box Trails. And I think um, there's a question in the chat box from Rebecca Arvin Collin about Blooms Park. And that's another park that has a trail that has been sadly, sad, excuse me, sadly neglected. And we would love to refurbish that. The problem is we can't recruit enough monitors to take care of these trails. So if anybody on here is interested in monitoring a bluebird trail, get a hold of Kim and she will send your information my way. I would be happy to have it. Absolutely. That would be actually a good thing to do. Thank you. And so, okay, done. <laughs> And that's a great thing to do with uh, families with kids or grandkids to have them out there and learn about the bluebird ecology and, and the value of cavities, artificial cavities and, and natural cavities. Indeed. Thanks, Julie. 
Well, it's really so great having a conversation with you all. I'm so glad you came. I always learn a lot from the presentation, but also from the people who are here. Um, oh yeah, Nancy reminds us that hooded mergansers use duck boxes too. Wood duck boxes. Yeah, I guess I would like to just mention one thing that if you do put up boxes like with the bluebird boxes and you can get them online, you can get patterns online and instructions on the Bluebird Society webpage about how to make sure that the boxes are protected so that the birds and the, the, the eggs are safe, that you have to also take care of them and check them once in a while and make sure that everything is going as it should be. So it's not just necessarily a question of putting it up and walking away. But I'll tell you, there's nothing more fun then checking a bluebird box and looking in and seeing everybody, ah, ah, feed me. It's really special and it's a great thing to do with kids. For sure. So and nesting season is coming up. So if anyone is interested in a box for your backyard or you know a nearby park uh, that would be suitable for a trail, uh, Virginia Bluebird Society, Track me down. I'd be happy to help. Yeah, email me and I can forward all the information. That's fine. My, you know where my webpage is and um, all our contact info is up there. So yeah, the bluebirds will be starting really soon. You just got to wonder how they survive the winter. I would yeah. never. <laughs> I'm lots bigger. <laughs> so um, anybody else have a comment? Well, we have Julie who's looking for places to plant trees, and Valerie, who's looking for places to um, add bluebird trails. So we got homework for all of us. Yeah, and I'll just, people are noticing or noting what other species use, for example, the wood duck boxes, but also in the bluebird boxes, we benefited um, greatly from one of our reforestations that were, was done at Veterans Park, where um, Kevin Parker um, put some a bluebird box in the reforestation that was only about a, a few years old at that time. And in that case, um, there was prothonotary warblers that um, nested in Marumsco Creek, along Marumsco Creek. They, prothonotary warbler, if you're not familiar with them, they, they love a, they love slow moving waters and overhanging uh, trees and they nest in cavities. So um, when he put, a, uh, when we did our reforestation and we did it right next to this habitat that already contained prothonotary warblers, we were very, uh, I didn't, I don't think I even thought about the, that the prothonotary warbler could move into that reforestation area quickly. But when Kevin put the bluebird box in there, he brought in the missing piece of ecology that they needed. So in a young forest, you're not gonna have cavities that the uh, natural cavities that the, the prothonotary warbler needs to nest in. So he brought in an artificial one. And within eight years of having planted the, the area, there was prothonotary warblers nesting in that reforestation and feeding their chicks and raising their chicks from just the insects that had invaded that reforestation project. So you, um, a, a bluebird box is not just good for bluebirds and um, it's, a, it's a great asset as a, a means of helping um, ecologically. Okay, so we can all do our little bits of good and together it makes a huge difference. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we are, we, yeah, congrats. we are um, recording it and it will be up on our YouTube page, channel, whatever, and we will send the link out to you when everything is up there. You have my contact info and um, please ask questions or give us resources that we can share with others. Thank you so much for coming hey, tonight. Hey, Kim, could I Thank bring you. in one other thing? Yep. We probably should have plugged the Native Plant Symposium. Probably everybody here knows about it, but if you don't know about it and you're interested in native plants, um, I, you guys have a, a Facebook, just Google Native Plant Symposium or, or Google uh, Stop Mowing, Start Growing, and you'll get there. It's a, it's a three-hour symposium coming up in about a week, which will help you understand more about how you can incorporate native plants into your yard to the benefit of wildlife. How silly of us to forget that. <laughs> and if you go to our Facebook page, it is up there and there's a link where you can register.